Uh, good afternoon, uh, and I guess to some also good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Philip Graham. I'm the project director for this uh, project that's funded through the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation as a part of, as a part of Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we're excited today to bring you the fourth in a series of webinars really focusing on uh, social capital and its development within human service agencies. I will have to tell folks uh, the today's uh, title is called Incorporating Technology, Measurement, and Guiding Principles in Your Organization. And you may not be able to tell, but I'm joining you from my iPad today instead of my laptop, which decided to die about a, a, an hour before today's uh, webinar. So as we talk about the importance of technology, we'll do a deeper dive. Uh, again, we are excited to bring this webinar to you to talk about a topic that I think was really important with respect to the importance of relationships in the context of those uh, re-entering communities uh, who've been formerly incarcerated. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, today uh, is a final section uh, in one of four, but it's structured a little different than the previous three. Uh, first, we're uh, are going to learn about the eighth and final practice in our series, which is really about incorporating technology in organization. And there you'll learn more about um, that particular practice via an excerpt from uh, work of what's called a Family Independence Initiative. Second, you'll hear from our federal uh, partner, ASPE, uh, who will provide a historical context for the social capital development <laughs> and really showcase an example of their internal work on social capital measurement. And then third, you'll learn more about guiding set of principles uh, that are identified through this project that we believe are integral to successful implementation of any social capital development uh, in your organization or organizations like yours. But this will be through the words of staff from one of our partners, uh, Hudson Link. And then finally, I'll spend some time doing a deeper dive and talking about five principles that we found in our work. Next slide. Most of you have heard the definitions of social capital if you participated in one of the first three webinars. So I want to do a re quick recap of what is social capital. Uh, really, it's about the connections and networks or relationships among people and the values that arise from them. But more importantly, it's about being able to access and mobilize individuals to help them succeed in life. And then finally, what does it provide? It can be information, it can be emotional or financial support and other resources. As we think about human interaction, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the kind of unique times that we're in with respect to COVID-19. And so that may require us to really think different ways of reconnecting or connecting uh, during our inability to be in person. So again, in many ways, this conversation about social capital and networks is important and also thinking about what does it look like in practice given what we're dealing with with this pandemic. Next slide. <clears throat> so as I said before, we've identified eight uh, emerging practices that we believe facilitate social capital development. And to date, we've shared seven of them with you. In webinar one, we really talked about valuing data and individuals with similar experiences. In webinar two, we really talked about three additional uh, uh, practices really around developing organic connections, the importance of peer groups, and also how you incorporate accountability into those processes. In our third webinar, we looked at fostering organizational participant and mentoring relationships. Again, uh, these are of seven of eight, uh, and we'll talk about the final one today. Next slide. So today, uh, I wanna spend some time talking about the final practice, and that's really using technology to build individual social capital. Some programs use social, uh, technology as a tool to help build community uh, among the people they serve, such as youth, or as a means to easily communicate with and support peer participants. And that could be, for instance, uh, facilitating parents' coordination of childcare or rise to school as simple ways of using technology. But other programs use technology to work with participants or they enable participants to use technology directly. And here are a couple of examples. Um, social media can facilitate social capital development. Uh, programs can help participants or graduates stay connected using social media, uh, social media tools such as WhatsApp or even Facebook. 
These tools can empower participants as a cohort and further their, uh, their individual social networks. Again, in the era of COVID-19, these platforms and these mechanisms become even more important in terms of connecting individuals uh, and really sustaining partnerships and networks. Uh, otherwise, uh, that would happen in person. <clears throat> but techn technology also allows us to use data uh, for social capital development. So for example, participants could use journaling and online surveys and other tools that really help participants see the value of social capital and really hold themselves accountable to the relationships they've developed and really enhance them with respect to self-sufficiency goals. Next slide. As I said before, uh, the work that we have uh, developed as a part of this project really uh, identified uh, agencies and organizations who are really incorporating social capital components into the work they're already doing. And so that's how we really identified these practices. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, the Family Independence Initiative and how they have used technology to both foster and build individual social capital. So FFI is a national uh, organization which uses social capital to help low-income families become more self-sufficient. And in its economic mobility program, low-income families really form cohorts of like six to eight individuals, often with someone in their family, but sometimes with friends. And for two years, the cohorts really hold monthly meetings in which the members really discuss goals and struggles and hold each other accountable to those previous commitments. And so here's how to use technology in this particular uh, program and strategy. Uh, based on families' feedback, they developed this platform that was called Up Together. And so it allows members to form small groups of their own and, uh, and without being in person, and they can also uh, in interact uh, without staff. But groups are able to really access this interactive digital tools for sharing social support and practical resources with each other and reach other goals and connect with groups across shared interest geography. So don't even have to be in the same place to use this platform. It's a strength base around social networking, but groups can connect with each other to share also resources that they already have in their relationships. So again, building on the use of technology around fostering stronger relationships. But they also use an online journal where participants document and quantify how they've helped others and how others have helped them. So really understanding the value of, of social capital. And by reflecting on the value of, of, kind of social capital, they can build and use this through other trusting and reciprocal relationships. So this is an example of that eighth and final practice that we call using technology. And so uh, what, what I wanted to do is really spend some time today really hearing from our partners uh, around what that looks like. Um, so, uh, before we do that, though, we also want to hear from you. So our first question of the day, and again, I should have mentioned earlier, we have designed these webinars to be interactive. So there will be learnings, both from what we share to you, but also from us. So there's, uh, we're going to spend a few minutes focusing on the next question. So what are some of the challenges and solutions to integrating technology in your organization to facilitate social capital development. So I'll give folks a few minutes to use a chat button function, function, and then Sarah will actually spend a few minutes kind of talking about some of the things. So unfortunately, I don't have any music that will be playing in the background, but if you could use that chat function again, what are some of the challenges and solutions to integrating technology and you, uh, into your organization to facilitate social capital development? And I like how some folks are saying solutions, colon, challenges, colon. So that will also make our or, uh, thematic organization a lot easier. 30 more seconds. And so Sarah, if you can start uh, looking for a couple of common themes and sharing that before we move to our next um, section.
So Sarah, if you'd be so kind to share some of those challenges and solutions folks have already shared uh, as it relates to incorporating technology into their uh, organizations. Sure. Hi, everybody. So most of the challenges seem to be around um, access. So access to internet, access to devices, um, <clears throat> and then also what is paired with that, which can also be digital literacy or computer literacy. Definitely seeing more challenges listed than solutions. Um, but some of the solutions uh, from, uh, we have one from Michelle around resourcing possible technology within the community. Um, as one, and then uh, just, let's see, Medicaid has free cell phones uh, as well. So just really trying to tap into resources where you can access some of devices or um, better, better technology to use for social capital. Okay, excellent. And I think Sophie also put in the chat box. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so the, uh, I think we have created, uh, and she will talk more about a series of uh, resources that have come up about th from this project. And so if those who are interested in really learning more about FFI, uh, there is a case study uh, um, that we've embedded um, as a part of resources that we'll share with you. Also, throughout today's webinar, um, Sarah will put um, re links to re various resources in the chat box. So please do copy those and share. So great, again, thank you for that feedback. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things I'm uh, also pleased to share with you today is a, a, a message and a word from our sponsor. Uh, we've been fortunate to partner with uh, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in this initiative. Uh, and so what we want to do today, this final webinar, is for you to also hear from our federal partners who really funded this work. And so Sophie Martinez is again within the Office of uh, Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation as a social science analyst. Sophie will talk about some of the work um, and provide again historical context for the overall initiative, but also spend some time talking about other projects that they're doing internally. Once she's given her presentation, we will also um, have uh, a few minutes for Q&A. So as she is giving her presentation, do put any questions you might have for ASPE into the chat box, and then we will uh, review those uh, after our uh, presentation. So Sophie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Philip. Yes, so on the next slide, um, we wanted to first just start out by telling you a little bit about what we do here at ASPE. And this is a picture of the very exciting building uh, that we work in during non-COVID-19 times. Um, but really, we conduct policy research and analysis and really coordinate work that's happening across the department because as you can imagine, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is quite large. So uh, coordinating work that's happening across the department can be very uh, important. And another thing we do is we create products to help inform work at the local level done by practitioners through products like these trainings. And we also kind of share findings from our research and from speaking with practitioners like you all uh, with our leadership in the Department of Health and Human Services to help them inform their policy development and uh, directions. So on the next slide, I want to talk to you all a little bit about our social capital work so far, which really started uh, two years ago when we had an internal speaker series where we had outside experts on social ca capital come in and present about their work. And from this, we've gotten uh, lots of work has emerged really, including this project with RTI and the UNC School of Government, which included a scan of over 300 programs uh, nationwide that are implementing different social capital practices. And from this work, we also held consultations with an expert panel to ultimately bring you the different social capital practices and principles uh, that we've been describing in this series. So while we continually hear from experts and practitioners like you that relationships matter and are really key to participants' success. We're also very aware that um, maybe from our position as the, in the federal government, that maybe the government isn't the best uh, actor in terms of creating and promoting relationships. But something we have heard is that from where we sit, uh, one thing that will be helpful is to help raise awareness and share practices so that programs don't have to recreate the wheel uh, when they're embarking on this work. So that's what we've been hoping to do through this series and um, also why we really value your input on kind of what will be most useful in helping to advance your social capital work. 
I know oftentimes when we ask that question to folks, one of the things that uh, repeatedly comes up is how to measure social capital so that you can do things like evaluate your participants progress and show the importance of social capital to any potential funders. So while we don't have time uh, in this series to go through the details of the work we've done around social capital measurement, uh, I did just want to show you the resources that we have on our website um, that can help you with social capital measurement as well as some of the other social capital resources that we have on our website. So on the next slide, uh, we highlight our webpage, aspe.hhs.gov slash social dash capital. And uh, believe it or not, we were actually really excited to get this short um, URL for our social capital work. Um, and we wanted to highlight in particular two, um, two items on this page that are under uh, the conducting research heading there on that web page. And the first is a link titled Strengthening Human Services Through Social Capital. And when you click on that link, you'll be directed to a web page with all of the different case studies that we've completed for this project, um, including the one on FII that uh, Philip just mentioned, as well as ones on Roca and Douglas County Community Mental Health Center, all of which um, we've highlighted previously in this series. And on that link, you'll also see uh, a brief we created with specific social capital considerations for working with incarcerated and reentering populations. And so the other resource we wanted to call out was our brief on measuring social capital. So on the next slide, uh, we talk about kind of what this brief entails, which is considerations for measuring social capital and different strategies for doing it. So for example, you might want to measure a person's social capital um, over multiple points in time so that you can see how it, how kind of their social capital levels change through their participation in your program. Or you might kind of want to assess different uh, aspects of a person's social capital. So you might want to ask questions to assess their access to resources in times of need through things like asking a person, um, do you have someone who you could borrow $100 from in an emergency? Or asking if they have someone in their lives who they deeply trust and getting more details about who this person is and you know how many individuals do they have in their lives that they would categorize as someone they deeply trust. And then another aspect you might want to ask about is uh, their community and civic engagement. So do they have a library card? Do they vote? Um, those sorts of things. So and in addition to the brief, we've also done a webinar on measurement um, that you can watch to learn more about and hear from other programs that are doing some innovative work around social capital measurement. So we'll also include that link in the uh, chat box as well. And on the next slide, uh, we just wanted to highlight some of our upcoming work. So soon we'll have a handbook ready to share with you all that explains each of the practices and principles described in this series in one unified document um, with examples and ideas on how to implement this work. And you can find kind of the different information that will be included in this webinar in the workshop materials that we'll be distributing afterwards. But once that handbook is ready, we'll be sure to, to send it out to you all in an email. And in terms of our upcoming work, we'll also be looking at the value of peer supports for pe people with uh, justice involvement and survivors of domestic trafficking and human or domestic violence and human trafficking. And one thing that we've already put out but did just want to flag is our social capital podcast series, um, which highlights our speakers from today at Hudson Link. So I'm sure after you hear from them, you'll want to tune into that podcast. Um, but really, you know, we really do just want to hear from what you all would think uh, would be helpful next in this. So please do reach out either through the chat box, the evaluation, or through emails, which are listed at the end of this slide deck. Uh, to give us your thoughts on what you would like to see next in this work. So I'll pause there in case anybody has any questions. But. Okay. Uh, as folks are putting questions in the chat box for Sophie, uh, Sophie, I did have one question for you. Yeah, what has been uh, one of the most, inter most interesting findings uh, from your internal social capital measurement work that you'd like to share with um, the audience today? <clears throat> yeah, so I think one of the things that's been really interesting is just um, the widespread interest in measuring social capital in general. Uh, it seems like this is something that people are really interested in, but feel like they're not necessarily don't have the right tools yet um, to be able to do it. And while we've definitely seen some very innovative, more high tech uh, responses like the FII um, platform that they're using, there's often kind of much more easy um, 
low tech ways to, to measure social capital. And we find that once organizations really hear all the different and innovative ways to measure social capital, they really realize that um, they might already be asking questions or collection data that really captures some aspect of social capital that they can use to, to start their measurement work. Great, so Sarah, uh, if you could check the chat box and see if there are any other questions for Sophie at this time. I have lots, so, um, but I wanna make sure the audience has an opportunity to um, get good feedback since we do have our federal sponsor on the call today. <clears throat> Sure, there's one about um, a list of, uh, it's more of a request, a list of social capital questions would be very handy. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure. We have Karen asking that question. Karen, if you could share if there's types of social capital questions you're interested in. Yeah, and I'll just flag. Um, so in that brief on social capital measurement, um, we do have some example questions uh, that, that folks could ask uh, that might be helpful, but I think that's also just a, a, a good kind of thing for us to put in our back pocket of things to, to consider in the future if we wanna expand upon that list. Okay, great. Those are all the questions. Well, hold on, there's some coming in. Um, what would be the first step for, um, for small nonprofits to measure social capital? Yeah, so I think the first step is really kind of probably just asking uh, your participants, right, starting, kind of think, considering when you wanna ask participants about their social capital levels. So maybe taking one of those questions um, that I talked about in the previous slide and using that to, to really just implement and kind of when you're doing your intake process or getting information about, uh, about your participants, you know, asking one of those questions and, and seeing kind of what information you start to get. And if I would add Sophie, and this is a plug for our handbook, Mm -hmm. particularly for small nonprofit organization, well, any organization in general. First, it starts by really understanding what social capital is as well as what social capital isn't. And so the handbook that Sophie just mentioned that also I think Sarah just put uh, the link will really also provide you with a nice roadmap for some of the things as an organization you need to think about with respect to this concept of social capital. And then once you've established that understanding, I think it will make even easier to move to identifying a few questions uh, with respect to what to measure. Do we have more time for questions, Philip? We actually we are doing super well, so we have a, uh, time for at least uh, two more questions before we move to our next section. Okay. Um, one question is on, is there a, a tool for basically figuring out a continuum around social capital? Uh, trying to figure out, you know, for instance, some people may have, um, you know, may, may be able to, you know, access resources or, you know, here we see like borrow a hundred dollars, but may, but they might, um, but some may have a much easier time actually getting that money compared to others. So sort of figuring out that, um, that spectrum or continuum. Yeah. So I don't think we have a, I think the brief is probably the best tool for, for figuring out the kind of different questions to ask and really thinking about like getting into the details of, you know, not only, oh, yes or no, do you have someone that you could borrow $100 from, but getting into, okay, who is that person? You know, how often uh, do you talk to them? Um, do you have their number in your phone? Kind of getting into more details about, just because someone says, yes, they have a person, making sure that they have the details kind of um, to see kind of how reliable that, that resource would be. And I think the other thing is making sure that we're asking about different types of social capital. So uh, you might have kind of a lot of connections that will make it easy to maybe watch your kids in a pinch if you need to um, emergency childcare, but maybe not uh, have someone that you could borrow $100 from, those sorts of things. So asking different types of questions um, can be helpful to see where your participants are potentially doing really well and where um, they might need some help. Uh, and so the next question, Aspie's obviously done this great work um, building this bank of information around social capital. So what's, what's next on Aspie's horizon in terms of uh, research for, around social capital? Yes, yeah, so next up is really um, that kind of peer supports work. So we know there's been a lot of work done on peer supports in the substance use space in particular, and we want to kind of expand that into the human services space, looking at the value of peer supports um, not only peers who maybe have had similar experiences with substance use, but also <coughs> peers who have had similar experiences with um, 
you know, uh, being incarcerated or being survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking and kind of getting the value um, from those peers as well. So that's kind of where we're moving next. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Sophie and um, uh, my colleagues for, uh, from ASPE for um, that wonderful overview. And so, uh, and we will, we will curate all the other questions. And so we'll figure out ways in which to share that back with the audience. So thanks everyone for uh, those wonderful questions. Next slide. <clears throat> So our work really suggests that before these practices can be implemented, organizations also and programs should also be grounded in certain principles. And, and this can be refer, referred to as ideas, conviction, and values uh, around uh, 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 kind of creating foundations that will allow for the development of social capital approaches. And so we work very closely with our colleagues at UNC School of Government uh, and with a set of expert uh, panels, and that included social capital researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and really federal staff to identify a set of guiding principles uh, for organizations interested in doing this type of work. And so we, uh, using a consensus um, just uh, make, making practice or process, we came up with five very distinct principles um, uh, in that process. Uh, but before we do a deeper dive in what we found, I want to do two things. First, I want to hear from you. So again, using the chat box function, I want you to answer the following question. What do you believe are some of the guiding principles for social capital? You know, which, or, which organizations really have as an interactive philosophy around engaging individuals in this work? And while you are using the chat function to do that, I get the pleasure of really introducing you to our first speaker uh, and some amazing work uh, that they do. Next slide, please. So um, Sean uh, Pika is the executive director of what's called Hudson Link for Higher Education in Prison. I mentioned earlier, and I apologize if not, a lot of our early social capital work has really been in the reentry space where we often understand that connections are often um, uh, non-existent as individuals are removed from friends, families, and communities during incarceration. But Hudson Link really is a non, not for, was a not for, not for profit, which really provides college education, life skills, and reentry support for uh, to incarcerated and or formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, it includes bachelor's and associate degree programs plus a college preparatory program. And Hudson really Link operates in five correctional facilities with eight college partners uh, across New York State. And social capital in, uh, activities really include student interactions during and after classes, uh, alumni gatherings, and ongoing support and encouragement from staff, many of whom are formerly incarcerated. And so uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier, there are additional resources. But in addition to being a part of our web, uh, podcast series, we also create a document that's called Strengthening Social Capital of Incarcerated and Reentering Individuals, Six Considerations. And so much of what we've learned from Hudson Link is also uh, presenting in that. After Sean really talks about uh, how those values show up in the work that Hudson Link has done, we also want to hear from one of his colleagues. So after Sean speaks, the second speaker will be Eldridge uh, Blaylock. And Eldridge is an alumnus of Hudson Link for Higher Education. And so and not only is he a graduate of the program, he is currently working as their development manager, really raising funds to support the work they're doing. So the next two voices you will hear will be Sean and Eldridge who really talk about what do those principles look like with respect to doing social capital work using Hudson Link as the um, kind of the backdrop of that. So uh, Sean, I'm gonna put up um, a slide that really is a collage of some of the work and people you guys uh, come in involved with. So with that, turn it over to Sean and Elders. Next slide. Okay. Philip, thank you so much. So uh, we have just been super excited to be involved, but I will also say too that the work that RTA and, and Justice, Justin and his team did with us was really eye-opening for us because I don't know if as a team we really saw the social capital as a tool that we were utilizing in the work that we do. And it, your report definitely opened our eyes to that work. Um, we are in five facilities. We have 644 men and women. We have now 10 college partners. Uh, and now this reentry component now also includes um, housing as well. 
uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is offered and run by folks that were affected by it. So 70% uh, of our team went through the program and now run it. It's the only degree granting college program in a prison in the country that's run, staffed, and coordinated by formerly incarcerated people. So um, for me as the ED of the organization that I uh, was able to take advantage of, I know the value of its life-changing uh, efforts, but I also know that the reason why we've been so successful is because of the relationships I built while I was in prison. Traditionally, someone will go to one prison, go through an orientation, and then uh, go to the prison that best suits their needs, and they'll spend the next 15, 20, 25 years in that prison. I, I was not the norm. I went through uh, nine different maximum security prisons. I served 16 and a half years. During that time, I took advantage of a lot of different programming, but I also met a lot of different people. And those people that I met while living in those prisons for nearly two decades have now worked their way up the ranks. And they are now, in fact, deputy commissioners working in central office, program team, wardens. And those relationships have been unbelievable in giving us a, a, a leg up with the rest of the programs that are doing this work. Um, the, the current warden at Sing Sing, I was his administrative clerk 31 years ago. Like, you can't even make stuff like that up. And when I was leaving prison, because I went in at 16 and I left when I was 34, when I walked out those doors, I had more time in prison than out of prison. So there was no part of my future that I thought was going to involve me going back into that prison. Um, I was very wrong. And when I left prison, I went to a halfway house right by the Hudson Link office and was just running errands and, you know, uh, stuffing envelopes and just assisting because to me, it was an organization that gave me a second chance at life. And now I'm home and I'm not working. Why not give back? Um, every time a board member had a question, every time someone from the Department of Corrections had a question, I realized I had all these answers because not only did I go through the program, I lived there for two decades. And next thing you know, I was offered a board seat. And then one day at an event, the current commissioner, the former commissioner, the warden at Sing Sing and the board chair of Hudson Lane cornered me in an event and said, hey, um, is there any chance we can convince you to come back into the prison and become the first director? Because at that point, there was just a board and there was, no, there was no staff yet. We had 60 students, one college partner, and no one knew where the staples were, you know? So I, I had literally earned 18 cents an hour for physically half my life. So I joked with the commissioner that while I would be, cons you know, consider the job and honored to be offered, we have to renegotiate my salary before we do anything else. But the fact is, they loved the idea of having someone that went through it come back in, and that was not what I expected. That's only half the work. The second part of the work obviously happens when someone comes home. Yeah, and again, thank you for having us. Um, so as Sean spoke about it, it begins inside, right? You, you know, um, you, you create this social capital, you begin to network, right? Uh, I too shoulder the mark of a felony conviction. I was just released last year um, after serving 21 and a half years. And it was Hudson Link that I, that I leaned on when I, when I got home. And, you know, we understand how important social capital is more intimately than many when it comes to the men and women being released. As Sean mentioned, 75% of, of our staff at Hudson Link are formerly incarcerated. So we understand, we experienced what it's like to get released, um, not have a place to go to, right? You know, and now in the program's 22nd year, uh, we have a strong focus on, on serving the over 1,200, right? 1,200 released students um, whose recidivism rate remains under 2%, right? And, and I make mention of that because we like to attribute that social that, that's to show to social capital that our men and women gain from our college program um so when they when when they're released um uh, I, I believe uh, we showed a picture of the alumni building which is located in Austin, new york this is the first spot that they come to they bring their family members of course it looks a lot different right now but they bring their family members they, they they're uh we, we give them welcome home bags with, which contain toiletries metro cards um, we give them business attire. Uh, sometimes we have, like, depending on the season, we get a bunch of food and, and, and um, again, these welcome home bags. Um, we get them laptop computers. We help them set up email uh, accounts because 
a lot of men and women like myself who served over two decades, some even 40, 40 years in prison, they come home, they, it's the first time they ever held a laptop in their hand. So we help them set up these email accounts. Um, we, we are connected to a number of different resources, responsible resources, not all resources that we, uh, we connect our students to are responsible. So we make sure we connect them with the, with the right resources. Um, as you see in the picture here, we give our book bags to our students who come home with children, right? We, we try to lighten the load as much as we can for our men and women returning home. And so, Sherry, yeah, so if you can just, uh, so if, if you guys, so we asked Hudson Link to pull together collage and I kind of represent it, uh, a lot of the work they do. Uh, we uh, wanted to make sure we had ample time today to do a deep dive and have folks ask questions about the work of Hudson Link, but also, you know, where these principles uh, uh, show up. Sarah, before we do that, if you would um, go to responses to the chat around what folks, some folks put in, in terms of some of those core values that they think are important. Uh, and then what we'll do is pivot and have, uh, start reading out questions for uh, Sean and Eldridge and spend some time kind of having a conversation around what this looks like in practice. <clears throat> Philip, if I may, just yes. one more thing. Um, it, it, it pinched on me to, to, to reflect on this once you showed a picture. Uh, we also hold bi-monthly alumni gatherings um, where the students, uh, professors, and, you know, uh, and our staff, we get to, you know, it's a fancy way of saying we get together, we eat pizza, and we, we have an opportunity to network with one another. And this is one of our strongest, uh, most successful uh, means of social capital because now the students, as Sean mentioned earlier, like, I went to my first alumni gathering. I, I, I saw Sean after, you know, he, he wasn't here when I came down my clothes, but I, I met with him at this uh, alumni gathering. We networked, we had a conversation. I met with guys who I haven't seen in 10, 15 years. And these guys are doing some great work. They're at the forefront of, uh, of civic engagement and um, they helped me get my first job, you know, and, uh, until I secured this position at Hudson Lake. And, and what a marvelous example, almost, a, almost perfect example of social capital in operation, right? So the, those networks, those relationships that lead to access to resources and opportunities. So perfect. And so thanks for sharing that, Elders. You are. So Sarah, uh, other principles shared with uh, from the audience? Yeah, so um, first there was an echo of what Sean said, which was um, social capital is really essential for reentry. It's not uh, an add-on. So I thought that was a good sort of segue or, or echoing your comment, Sean. Um, other principles or values that were mentioned were trust, uh, which we know has come up uh, a lot, of course, uh, a core value of love, um, and then uh, some chatter around the importance of people who've had shared or similar experiences. Um, and having experienced similar events, that this really provides the ultimate credibility uh, with others. Uh, so that was some really good comments on that. And then uh, lastly, safe, comfortable spaces where people can lower barriers and, and communicate. <clears throat> Sounds good. And Sarah, I'm gonna let you uh, segue into our questions from the audience and those again uh, for uh, Sean and Eldridge. Uh, so if you can just start, we have, we, again, we are doing great on time. So we have a couple of minutes to really to do a deep dive. So if you would start um, sending questions their way and for others who are listening, if you have questions for Sean and or Eldridge, um, and Edith, if you have a question for Sophie that came up after listening, uh, here's a time um, to ask those questions. So Sarah, if you would start going down that list, that would be great. Sure, sure. So first of all, it's like the double hand praise emoji for, for Sean and Eldridge. It's a lot of uh, uh, call outs that are calling you rock stars and just really uh, praising your work um, and thanking you for sharing this. Um, one question that's come up a couple of times is, where do you get your funding? And I think an interesting uh, sort of add on to that is how do funders view social capital as well? So um, ironically, we started this knowing there was no access to state or federal funding. And then I spent literally the next 10 years fighting to find state and federal funding. And now during COVID, when everyone that gets state and federal funding is struggling because it's so crazy, we don't receive it. We, we rely 100% on um, local funders, uh, foundations, 
uh, community organizations and the churches and local churches and synagogues, which have been so generous throughout, uh, not just this time, but you know, at all times. Um, even now with this construction initiative that we launched, uh, we're using formerly incarcerated men and women to partner with local contractors to renovate properties. But we're specifically picking properties um, that are the most devastated in, in the neighborhood. The first one was abandoned for seven years. So it was empty for so long that the neighborhood will never get it fixed. No one's going to take it on. So we literally put $300,000 into a home that's worth $300,000. And the funders loved it because it was not a construction project. It was this opportunity to, for training, for days work for days pay, to create housing for our students, to connect community members, these local contractors, with our students and see them in a very different light. They were literally hiring them off the construction site. The neighbors got involved. This was so much more than just a construction project. But guess what? In the end, we have beds for returning students as well. The first one's done. The doors are open. It is run and managed by the men that live in it. And now the second project will be nine beds for women. And the women are doing the construction on that one. So it's an incredible opportunity to create housing. The single biggest indicator for a successful transition is a safe bed. So just giving college isn't enough. We have to have these wraparound services as well, and the funders get it. But I will also say we're spoiled here in New York, especially Westchester. We've helped five other states replicate this program. We're currently helping North Carolina and Tennessee. And the fact is New York is in a very different position than most of the nonprofits in how we raise money and who we raise money with. So I don't want to act like this is easy. I do want to say it is easier here in Westchester in New York to raise money for these kinds of yeah. programming. Ultimately, and, and that's how the, the funders view social capital, just by what Sean mentioned, right? You know, our men and women are, are at the forefront. They, they, they're seeing that, you know, it, it works. And social capital, when it comes to reentry, I think someone wrote it in the chat. It, 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 you know, it's, it's essential. It's not only essential, it's the most important variable when it comes to reentry who you know and how you, you, you apply it to, to when you come home. And that's what we're doing at Hudson League, trying to give everyone that opportunity. And these funders are seeing that. Like when we put our, our students, we have our students getting paid, learning on the job, construction with, with uh, you know, on the job, that right there is in itself. It, it, it's working and our, our funders are, are recognizing that. We're working directly with the Tennessee Higher Ed Initiative. It's the college program in, in the prison. And actually, one our deputy director is on their board of directors. Um, we, we have helped other programs replicate for free. Um, we end up sleeping on some student's couch. Um, and then, you know, we just give all our resources. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing we bring to the table to a state that's never tried this before is that we walk into a room, we're wearing a suit and tie. Nowhere in that conversation do they realize we're formally incarcerated. And then as I'm talking to the warden at the main state prison and her team, they say, well, this sounds great, but we can't do it in a maximum security prison. And then I talk about my own past, the team that I work with at the Sing Sing prison, and hey, if you could do it in New York, you could do it somewhere. And it opens that door to thinking, because if you can't think about it, like, like if you can't envision it, you can't think about it, you know, you can't envision it. So I think a lot of that has been opening up those doors, what we're already doing here in New York as formerly incarcerated people. So, um, Sarah, uh, other, we probably have about three more minutes for questions. And so I um, want to get in as many as possible. I also see a great, you, you guys, uh, looks like you're going to be busy. I think lots of folks <laughs> are trying to get you hired to come help them out. So, uh, but uh, other questions, Sarah? Sure. Uh, aside from going global with all this interest, um, what is your staff size? So when I took over as the first director, we were 10 years old. It was me and an admin. There was the board of directors. There were 66 students and one college partner. 10 years later, we have 18 staff members, uh, a bunch of interns. We have a full reentry team. We have four properties. We have 10 college partners and we have 644 students in five sites. Wow. Great. Um, and there was one other question around, um, how do you approach accountability? Accountability for in general? Let's start with in general. Um, yeah, let's start in general. I'm not sure. I will just say Eldridge and I just met with a local funder 
uh, right before COVID hit and we sat down at lunch and I knew the director of the foundation from another foundation. So she was so excited to see us and reconnect. And she said, oh my God, I heard that 70% of your staff is now all formally incarcerated. And I started crying in the meeting because this, I, I love the fact that we've hired so many of our own students, but it is a lot of work to hire two guys like us that are formerly incarcerated. If you think about where we grew up, so many things that people take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis that we have, I've never saw the internet before. I've never had a cell phone before. And now we're in charge of managing a two and a half million dollar organization and fundraising to do it. It is so scary to do this work and hire the folks that we serve. But for me, I feel like it's the most important part of this work is to, I, I don't know, to have it led by those affected. Um, and also, when we walk back into these prisons and the guy that just walks into the Sing Sing serving 25 to life, he's 17 years old, and he just thinks his life is over. And all of a sudden, he looks at us and says, man, if you guys could do it, I could do it. And their life changes in that instant. Um, it, that is a... a I want to thank both Sean and, and Eldridge for um, uh, that additional sharing and learning. And I think this is a nice segue into really talking about some of the principles uh, that we uh, think are valuable. And these don't just, these weren't just pulled out of the sky and it's really from a lot of work, but really uh, based on interactions with folks like uh, Hudson Link and other organizations doing this work. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So out of our work with, with, with a, um, a fairly diverse group of uh, stakeholders and providing input, we came up with five social capital principles. Again, things that we think you need to think about in doing this work. And as Sophie mentioned earlier in our handbook, which we're super excited uh, to share with you, it talks more in depth both about those practices as well as these principles. But there are five here and people at the center was something that came up and at first we we didn't know what that meant. What do you mean people at the center? And so it kept coming up again and understanding that if you're gonna do this kind of transformative work, the individuals you're working with are key to that. Uh, the second was relationships as assets, uh, staff and participants as partners. I think you've seen both in Sean and Eldridge, uh, a real live example of that, cultural competence and, uh, and emotional intelligence. And I wanna spend a, a few more minutes doing a slightly deeper dive into each of those five. Next slide, please. So people at the center, uh, many of social capital programs we study explicitly aim to center individuals or families by reviewing participants as experts, uh, inviting them to drive the goals and services and using staff as facilitators and supporters instead of, uh, uh, instead of professional directors for lack of a better term. Uh, these programs also try to understand how trauma might impact participant engagement and really rapport development, which are all really key for success and when participants are listened to, given the autonomy to help drive the process, we see uh, both Sean and Eldridge really managing two point plus million dollars. Um, that's about trust, right? And so in doing that, um, staff are able, participants are able to feel uh, more cared for, respected, and able to really uh, develop trusting relationships. And there's a reciprocity in that too with all the individuals and volunteers involved in the program. Next slide. The second principle around relationships as assets, and generally staff and participants of successful social capital programs really consider social capital as a critical asset. And I think someone may have mentioned that in, in the chat. Now, this is not one of the things you could, should think about doing. Social capital has to be a part of this space as it relates to reentry. <clears throat> and so thus program leaders really should seek to build, nurture, leverage, and monitor social capital. As an evaluator or researcher, that measurement piece also is critically important to doing this work. So again, those relationships are assets and should be treated as assets in terms of building and growing. Next slide, please. <laughs> the third principle is staff and participants as partners. You've already seen this and I think I almost don't need to read this slide, just whatever Sean and Elder just said, that's what this looks like in practice. But really some programs uh, we've reviewed really provided 
participants with the agency to use the program structure and scope uh, that worked in a way that was explicitly uh, for them through their eyes. And one way to do this is to put individuals and staff uh, and volunteers on equal footing, uh, attempting to minimize any sense of uneven power dynamics, understanding just because you're incarcerated does not mean you're less than. And so again, this issue of equity and equal footing is key to doing this work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Cultural competence, and so here we talk about really uh, um, the importance of really understanding where folks and individuals come from, right? How do you promote positive and effective interaction with diverse cultures? That first means understanding those, and so having a team uh, of staff and volunteers both live the experience and understanding the relevance of culture in and the way in which we address these issues becomes even more important in our current um, uh, environment with respect to how we think about individuals and respect them despite of their past, and they really are making strides for improvement. And really the last part is can, um, it can be challenging as staff and volunteers uh, because they may have different lived experiences, but really understanding the importance of those differences, recognizing and acknowledging them are what you have to do to really make this work. Next slide. And that fifth and final um, uh, uh, is around emotional intelligence. And really emotional intelligence really involves the capacity to effectively navigate emotions. And so that's something that folks really need to spend the time understanding what it looks like in practice, what kind of trainings would you need to get to fully understand that. And this can lead to stronger bonds and trust and really help staff and volunteers navigate sensitive interactions. We understand that in, in, in working with trusting individuals who were formerly incarcerated is not easy. And so understanding some of the rationale and reasons for why they end up in the situations they were and really giving them the opportunity to make changes in their life. So there's an issue about I, EI is critically important. So that represents really the five uh, principles that we think are critically important to doing this work before you ever begin to implement a social capital strategy, having these things in place is critically important. Next slide. So um, we, uh, what's next? And so we're excited and I think Sophie's already kind of laid this out in some of our work around peer groups in the context of social capital strategies, but with respect to domestic violence, human trafficking programs. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us, not only for today's webinar, uh, but for the previous three. Uh, you can expect to hear from us again on Monday. We'll email you a certificate of completion and, but most important, a link to all the resources. And I think someone may have asked before, we uh, are including uh, recordings of the webinar and those will be posted either on the RTI or NC Impact uh, website. Again, you will receive the links for both of those. So uh, I would ask and folks to share those with your friends and colleagues uh, of the entire series and all of the resources that we've shared over uh, this four part series. Next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, here's uh, the link uh, that Sophie talked about earlier. So in addition to all the work that RTI and UNC School of Government have done, uh, you will see, uh, again, an additional set of resources about the Social Capital Initiative. So again, uh, please do leverage these resources. It's pretty cool that the federal government also understands the value and importance of networking and relationships and really using social um, human service agencies to really facilitate that. Uh, next slide. This work would not have occurred without first the funding of ASPE, but also uh, an incredible team of colleagues. And so um, again, uh, both I, Anita Brown Graham and Maureen Brenner uh, participated in kind of co-hosting the first three webinars. Uh, Maureen is the uh, Associate Project Director with me. Anita Brown Graham really subject matter expertise uh, and the Director of the uh, NC uh, Impact Initiative. If you have any questions about this work, the specific project, please do not hesitate to email us. We are excited to learn more about what folks are doing uh, in this space and also taking those learnings to really grow this work. Next slide. Um, that team is really undergirded by a set of colleagues that make the engine flow. And so here you'll see both um, our colleagues uh, and team, both on the RTI side, as well as the UNC School of Government. Again, 
This has been a team effort in every way humanly possible to really understand this work in a meaningful way. And next slide, uh, last but not, uh, and we talk about funding, this work would not have happened if not by, uh, for the um, Social Capital Initiative, which has been funded by ASPE and within the Department of Health and Human Services. And ASPE has not just been a, a sponsor and a funder, uh, they have been collaborators in this work in a very intimate way that has pushed and challenged us to think about how to do it in this context. And again, particularly with the um, um, current pandemic, how do we still uh, make sure that connections and networks are still going? With that next slide, I want to thank everyone for spending, uh, hopefully all of you have been on all four of these webinars, but again, uh, our assets and resources are available for you. And so please let us know how we can continue to do this work better. Uh, please do reach out to us, things that we did not cover that you are thinking are important in this world will be great. And last but not least, I'd be remiss if I got, again, thank our incredible uh, co-presenters and Sean and Eldridge and Sophie. Um, seeing this work in practice is much better than listening to me talk all day about what we know from a research perspective, but understanding what it looks like in practice. So uh, this has been a privilege and an honor for me to be a part of this. And so I ask all of you to continue to do the great work you're doing as it relates to social capital and really understanding the power of relationships. And as some people say, the secret sauce that really makes it run in terms of uh, improving the outcomes of individuals, families, and communities. But that, thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you again, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.